So I'm delighted to see so many of you here today at one of our series of lectures that I am hosting as part of my Women in Public Life campaign. And this campaign is aimed at getting more women in, wa in Wales involved in public life by becoming magistrates, councillors, lawyers, school governors and seeking other public roles, but mainly trying to get women into positions of decision making. Because at the moment we tend to implement the decisions as opposed to making the decisions and I think we need to turn things around. So central to that campaign is providing strong role models through a series of keynote lectures here at the Peer Head. Now, many of you will know that I spent much of the last year encouraging women across Wales um, in, in a series of regional seminars um, and finally a, a national conference here in Cardiff. And I'm encouraging them to you know, come out of their shells. Uh, and I really was inspired by the talent that we have here in Wales and delighted by the actions that are now beginning to be taken. But having had a discussion with Anne Bynum just now, we need to move things up a gear, girls. There's no doubts about that. So my, my, my tour around Wales did confirm that we as women in Wales have much to be proud of, but they're, you know, they're in, we have all this expertise, we're not tapping into it. The knowledge and experience of women across Wales is really quite staggering and we're just not using it. There are many fewer women than men in public life and as a result their voices are not being heard. Now, As a woman and a politician, I want to see fair representation of women in decision-making positions. So why? Why do we want to do that? Well, because people make decisions based on their own experiences. And if those who make the decisions come from a very narrow part of society, then society won't be fairly represented. For this reason, as well as this lecture series featuring role models from traditionally male-dominated fields, I will shortly be launching an online portal where training, public appointment information and the public forum will be available in one place. Now you can follow this, and I think this is what I'm saying, is hashtag POW1PL, which is actually pronounced Po Whipple. Um, so you can do that for news, uh, and also you can tweet, not tweet, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Be careful what I say there. You can tweet uh, as part of today's session. Uh, and the hashtags are actually, um, well, they're not on the table, because there's no table. So anyway, I'm sure you, those who you understand these things will ha already have the hashtag. Now, hopefully, this portal will be truly innovative, offering the opportunity of access to a wide range of highly experienced women who have agreed to be online mentors. Now, there's been a lot of activity and publicity around this issue in the last few months, and it will be fantastic when things move on to the next stage, hopefully in the near future. So if you are interested in being a mentor, please let one of the event staff have your details. We will be delighted if you would join us. For today, however, I am very honoured that our guest, Shami Chakrabarti, accepted my invitation to participate in this campaign, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from her today. I am confident we will leave here inspired by her words, and therefore, without any more from me, I would like to hand over to today's very able chair, Anne Bynand, to introduce our esteemed guest. Gai ddiolch o galon i gychwyn i Rosemary Butler am i arweinyddiaeth hi ar yr agenda hollol hanfodol hwn o gydoddoldeb rhwng gwryw a benyw yng Nghymru. Ydyn da ni wedi cyflawni dipyn, da ni ddim wedi cyflawni digon o bell bell ffordd. Mae'n y dipyn o waith eto i wneud. A fy ngofid i, a dwi'n credu byddai fe'n gofid o fyd sy'n cael ei rannu gyn amryw yma heddi yw bod ni o bosib yn llithro nôl yn hytrach nag yn camu mlaen. Felly, gadwch chi ni fod yn bositif, ond a, a gorau yn yr ochr bositif, mae e'n hyfryd bod Cynulliad Cynuleithol Cymru wedi bod y strai blynyddoedd ar flaen y gad ac yn enghraifft clodwyw o'r hyn y gellid ddi gyflawni yn herme cydroddoldeb. Uh, ar hyn o bryd, o yn y Cynulliad Cynuleithol, mae 42,000 o aelodau'r Cynulliad hwnnw yn fenywod, a ydyn ni yn ddiolchgrad iawn am hynny. Ond, O edrych teg at y dyfodol, sut mae cynnal y cydbwysedd hwnnw, sut mae gwella y cydbwysedd hwnnw, a sut mae edrych ar y cydbwysedd drwy Gymru bendi fadde o'r de i'r gogledd o'r gorllewyn y dwyrain am hob agwedd o'n bywyd cenedlaethol ni, be sydd o'i le na dyw menywod ddim yn hanner cant y cant o bob gweithgarwch yn y genedl hon. 
Ond ti'n un edrych ar yr ystadegau fe welwn ni yn y sector breifet a dwi'n gweithio yn y sector honno. Dwi'n maen dwy fenyw sy'n gyda ni yn brif weithredraig yn yr hamar cant cwmni mwyaf yng Nghymru. Um, Strategi'n arall sy'n sobri ni gyd yw ers 1536, dwi'n maen 3 ar 10, 3 ar 10, ers 1536 o fenywod sydd wedi bod yn aelodau seneddol yn San Stefan. A mae hynny oherwydd bod ha, i hanner nhw, i hanner nhw wedi dewis o restrau fer ar gyfer mynywod yn unig. A mae hynna i mi yn amlygu pwysigrwydd gweithrediadau bwriadol i sicrhau newid. Bod ni ddim yn gallu eistedd yn ôl ar dagad ar hyn natur gymryd i gwrs, neu fyddwn ni hyma yn ganrifoedd. Does gyda ni bellach ddim menyw yn arwain dim mi'n on, on, on gwasanaethau heddlu ni? A pump ar hyn y cant ond cynghorwydd ni sy'n fenywod. Pedwar allan o'r dau ar hygen brif oedthredwr a wedi dod lleol sy'n fenyw. Trwy bod yn bositif, mae yna un llygedu'n bach o obau, lle mae yna gant y cant o bresenoldeb benywaif, um, a mae hynny o fewn sefydliad hanesyddol iawn yng Nghymru, sef uh, gorsedd beir yn ys Prydain. Uh, Falle bod rhai eich ni'n gwybod, ond yn y mae tro cyntaf ers 1792, mae gyda ni'n fenyw ar fi'n cymryd uh, cyfrifoldeb i fod yn archdderwydd Cymru, sef Christine James o'r honfa. So, mae wedi cymryd dipyn o amser, ond y lia yn y rhan honno yn bywyd cyhoeddus ni, dim ond un archdderwydd sydd a dim ond menyw sydd yn y swydd honno. Um, beth ni'n ni'n neud i, I greu gwahaniaeth? Mae'n rhaid i ni edrych ar bethau ymarferol i'w gwneud. Mae'n rhaid ni gael y pynciau i ni a diddordeb yn ni nhw ar yr agenda. Mae'n ni'n gwahanol fwy o gyd weithio. Allwn ni ddim cyfion hau sefyllfa, lle mae gyrmaen to dalen sy'n cymdeithas ni ar ddisberod a ddim yn cael ei ddefnyddio er gwellhad pawb. Um, dros y penwythnos um, yn y Sunday Telegraph, mi oedd yna erthygl gan Helen y Morrissey yn dweud um, chi'n gwybod, Dyfynnu o Harvard Business Review yn mis Mehefi'n 2010, beth sy'n gwneud tîm o bobl yn fwy deallus ac yn fwy effeithiol, mae'r ateb yn un gair menywod. Uh, felly, i symud ymlaen. <laughs> I symud ymlaen. Um, ma, ma, ma Shami, ydych yn ddor iawn i Shami oedd y dyma heddi. Shami will talk today about women, power and change. Um, recently listed among the 100 most powerful women in the UK, Shami will share her views on what having power means and if power is fairly distributed amongst men and women. Uh, she has been uh, leading uh, Liberty since September 2003 and she's also a Chancellor of Oxford Brookes University and also has a CBE. Um, Liberty, as many of you know, is the National Council for Civil Liberty, it was known as that, it was founded in 1934, it is cross-party, a uh, non-party membership organisation at the heart of the movement for fundamental rights and freedoms in the United Kingdom. It promotes the values of individual human dignity, equal treatment and fairness as the foundations of a democratic society. Liberty campaigns to protect basic rights and freedoms through the courts, in Parliament and in the wider community. And they do this through a combination of public campaigning, test case litigation, parliamentary lobbying, policy analysis, and the provision of free advice and information. We are truly delighted to have Shami with us today, and I'd like to welcome her very much to us. Thank you so much, Anne, and um, thank you especially to um, our Madam Presiding Officer. The, the honour is really mine. I've been in um, Wales for less than an hour, and I feel truly inspired already. Um, um, I'll, I'll go back now and go and, do some, go and do some work. I am not in a position to lecture you or anyone else on this subject for reasons that will become apparent. But what I am going to do um, is to speak to you personally and professionally from my experience and from the heart. I am a feminist. I am... Is that, am I allowed to say that? Is, are we allowed to use the F word or is that... It's, no, but it, it, it's funny, isn't it, that, that this is not a word that everyone is comfortable with, and I don't really understand that, and I think we need to explore that 
uh, a little. I was, I was telling the presiding officer that I was on a, a, a plane with my 11-year-old son recently going to speak about these issues um, in, in Sydney as part of the, the, the Women of the World Festival, which is a, a festival that started on the South Bank. It's uh, been organised by my, my friend Jude Kelly. Uh, who is a feminist and, uh, and a, great, uh, a great mover and change maker. And we were going off to, to, to Sydney to, to experiment with, with a mini version of this festival. And goodness me, they could do with it. You know, the, the, the sisters in Australia need a little bit of solidarity. There's another word that not everyone's comfortable with. So we've done feminism and we've done solidarity. How many more of these words are we going to tick off before, before we're done um, this afternoon? So I was on the plane with my son. And I, um, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a long way. It's a, it's a long trip, and you know, you're, you know, there's a lot of conversation to be to be had. And I joked with him that uh, I'd needed research to do the particular a particular talk that I was um, I was doing there because um, because I was speaking about the world and not just about the United Kingdom. And and, and liberty is, is generally focused. On, um, on, on, on places close to home. And so I'd said to him, you know, of all the legal trainees in the office that, that um, was available to, to do the, re the research for me before I went on this trip, um, the, the recommendation was the one boy trainee. There were four or five trainees in the office that week. And my colleague said, no, you must, Tom must do this research. He's got very good research skills. And I made light of this and made a joke of it with my, my son who's just 11. And he was very upset with me. And he said, why are you, you know, why, why are you remarking on that, Mum? He said, a, a man can be a feminist too. And I said, well, darling, I rather agree with you. I rather agree with you. Um, though at times, you know, in history, this has been a live debate. But I, I, I rather agree with you. And then I said, just to continue the conversation, I said, do, do, do you consider yourself a, a feminist? And he paused for a moment and he said, uh, well, yes, but, um, but not die hard. <laughs> So he's a work in progress, and we'll get we'll get to we'll get to die hard one day. I'm I, 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 I'm I'm absolutely sure about that. What um, wasn't said in the very kind introduction of me is that um, is that I was once called the most dangerous woman in Britain by the Sun newspaper, that great that great feminist publication. <laughs> Um, by, um, by a man who um, changed his mind um, about human rights and about liberty and I suspect about me when he was subsequently sacked as a shock jock for criticising a politician and losing his temper and you know, there were complaints to Ofcom and he ended up you know, he's currently got a case pending in the European Court of Human Rights so, that, so they, that, that, there you go um, um, in my experience everybody loves human rights whatever they whatever they grumble about human rights. Everybody loves their own human rights. Yeah? It's other people's that they've got a problem with. Yeah? My speech is free for the next few minutes at least. Yours is a bit more expensive until we get into, into the discussion. So yes, I was once called the most dangerous woman in Britain. And I think, you know, to be fair, Mr Gaunt and his publication did me a bit of a favour with that little touch of notoriety. I didn't lose much sleep about it. And goodness me, if this is it, for the most dangerous woman in Britain, you can all sleep pretty safely in your, and soundly in your, in your beds tonight. Um, a little bit more um, concerningly, though, I think, I, I, you can, and you can look this up on YouTube, I was once on um, the BBC uh, panel programme Question Time uh, when a former cabinet minister um, uh, suggested that I was being emotional. Um, you can look it up, look up, Chakrabarti Hoon was his name. Um, he was called. He was called. I think he was called Jeff Hoon. He's, it was. It was a while back. I, I. I don't know what he's up to these days. But um, we were having a debate about torture, about extraordinary rendition. I love these euphemisms that people come up with for human rights abuses, don't you? You know, waterboarding is not a seaside sport, ladies, you know. It's drowning suspects. And extraordinary rendition is not singing old Lang Syne on New Year's Eve. It is, it is kidnap and torture. So we were having this debate about that, and he accused me of being emotional. Um, and I, I suspect my response was slightly emotional. But, um, but let's face it, it was a very, very openly misogynistic a put down, and I think it. I, I think 
um, if you if you look at it on YouTube, you can you can decide for yourself. But it was a it was a little bit of um, of my um, my broadcasting experience that did divide people in their response. Or I think um, to some extent um, on gender lines. And I'm telling you this because. Um, I want to be blunt about it not always being easy to put your head above the parapet. I want to encourage everyone to do it, but not by pretending it's not by pretending it's easy, but by saying it's sometimes tough, but it's worth it. And there is enormous solidarity and strength and and sisterhood. There's, an, there's another word that you don't hear um, to, to, to be gained from it. And um, I think I'm going to you know, make one more complaint. So I'm, I've been the most dangerous woman in Britain. I've been emotional on TV about torture. This is the, this is the, um, the description that I actually find most difficult. And this was not from public life. This is when I left my previous employer, because I wasn't always a human rights campaigner. Um, I, once upon a time, I was a lawyer in government in, 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 in Westminster, and I was a lawyer in a place that is otherwise known as the Dark Tower or Mordor, um, and they sometimes call it the Home Office. <laughs> so I was a lawyer in the Home Office. Yes, it's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? You know, I'm, I, I was a Jedi Knight who came from the dark to the light side of the force, you understand. Um, and I, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, uh, before, because at Liberty we often protect the, the guilty uh, alongside the innocent, but I think it may be relevant, so I'm going to say it, that um, a very senior person in that department who was very cross with me when I, um, when I left um, that job to, to come and work at Liberty um, said of me that I had been this is after sort of nearly six years of being a, being a lawyer and serving governments of both sides and doing all sorts of wicked things and giving advice and legislating. He said that I had been of statistical value to the department. And he said that to, um, to junior colleagues, including you know, men and women, and what kind of, what kind of leadership um, is that? Um, so that's the and that's the most concerning. I think you know, it being emotional about torture. Yeah, tick. That's me. I'm emotional about torture. I think it's wrong. You can look at the exchange on YouTube. It's great fun. And the most dangerous woman in Britain. Britain's a safe place. That's good. But st of statistical value to the department, right? And this is um, this is a sort of constant potential tension in this debate. Is it not? You know. Are we afraid of being tokens? If we call for affirmative action to speed up change because change is so slow, are we worried about being tokens? Do you know, I have changed my mind about this. I think it's possible that years ago when I was, you know, um, uh, a naive young lawyer that I thought that we didn't need um, affirmative action and we didn't need all women shortlists and we didn't need to take positive steps on the boards of companies and so on. I have changed my mind. My experience, not just my personal experience, but my observed experience of the world around me and the pace of change and how slow it is has changed my mind. And now I say, not so much a token as a beacon. And if it, ta if it takes certain steps for a period of time, legislative steps, practical steps, to, to, to speed up change, to change the quality of the experience, to create a critical mass of women in any, um, in, in any seat of power, then I think it needs to be done. Because we are, I think, dealing potentially with the biggest global injustice of all. And I say that as a human rights campaigner. I'm not just a feminist. I'm a human rights campaigner. The two are intertwined as far as I'm concerned. I don't think you can really be one without being the other. And the older I get and the longer I do this work, the more I think that gender injustice is possibly the biggest injustice in the world if you're talking about a disadvantaged group. Not a minority, <laughs> a group. But I think it may be the, the biggest, most systematic, deepest-seated prejudice stroke injustice in the world and 
addressing it may also be the key to achieving all sorts of other positive changes in the world in relation to um, sustainable development and peace and prosperity and on it goes. I think this is a glaring injustice and I'm impatient for change and I hope that I hope that you are too. So next time you're feeling, as we all do sometimes, a little self-deprecating and a little embarrassed about being, you know, as I, as I felt when nice things were being said about me, that's bit, when, I, when everyone was looking at me, even though that's, you know, that's what I do for a living. Next time you're feeling like that and you're shuffling in your seat and you're worried about being um, lauded and celebrated and pushed forward in that way, think about the world think about the world. You know, it was Eleanor Roosevelt who was, I think, the, you know, the grandmother of, of human rights. Yeah. After World War II, this is the moment when freedom struggles from around the world settle into a space that we call international human rights for human beings just because they're alive. Not for English people or Welsh people or Americans or good people or bad people or taxpayers or just for everybody, just because they're alive. She, as far as I'm concerned, is the grandmother of our movement, and she famously said, did she not, that human rights begin in small places close to home. Places so small and so close that they will never be found on any map of the world. And of course, what she was saying is we need to change, you know, in these intimate spaces. We need to deal with the misogyny and inequality in families and communities and workplaces and classrooms, just as we need to do it um, on a national and, and regional and an international level. That's what we need to do. Now, I do... I, I am inspired by what you've achieved already in Wales. I think it's wonderful the level of your um, aspiration and ambition could be an example by itself to, to women everywhere. But I'm, I'm so glad that your presiding officer and that Anne are still hungry for better progress, that you're going to be a beacon. I have no doubt. I've been here less than an hour, a bit over an hour now, as I'm going on. Um, I have no doubt that you're capable of doing something incredibly special here in Wales. That you've got the ingredients, you've got the recent history. You started off, I believe, with about 50% in the Assembly. You've got to go back to that really quickly. You start slipping and you'll never go back. It's about 40%, 42% now, I think. I was, no, no, that's not good enough. Let's go to 52% and be the beacon for the world because I understand that on a global level, it's only 21% of, um, of um, legislators who are women, 21% in the world, that's just, that's just not good enough. I don't have 100 years, I'm not going to be around for another 100 years, you might, you know, some of you look like, you, you know, you might manage it, <laughs> I'm not going to manage it, I want change now, I want change in my lifetime. When I was younger, I didn't think I'd see the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall or the end of apartheid in South Africa or relative peace in Northern Ireland. And then suddenly history speeds up at certain moments. And so why can't it speed up on this issue? Economically, women, this is even worse, women have only 10% of global income. So the res economic resource is 10% in the hands of women. And that, of course, has consequences for the children and, and priorities about, uh, about what's done with that, with that wealth. Um, they've got uh, one in, uh, th 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 I, I could go on with all these, with all these statistics about um, I injustice in relation to education prospects, in relation to, I've got to do one on health because I think this is an absolute shocker. Um, for anyone who, um, who has had children. How about this? Um, Amnesty reports that in Sierra Leone, one in eight women die giving birth. That's now in the 21st century. One in eight. Imagine being a woman in Sierra Leone. So what do you do? You write a suicide note. You go into labour, you write goodbye letters like those Victorian women used to do, yeah? Before you go to give birth, you're preparing yourself and perhaps your other children for the possibility, the strong possibility, the one in eight chance of your death. 
Now, I'm sorry, it, it all comes back to political representation because if there were more women in seats of power in institutions nationally and internationally, I don't believe that that would be allowed to pass, to stand. I just do not believe it. That is not a priority. That is not a statistic that you hear every single day. Why? Because it's not a priority, because there aren't enough women in seats of power nationally and globally, I believe. And I have to, I'm not in a position to lecture anybody, because I don't feel that I have done enough. I don't feel that my organisation's done enough. I don't feel that women of my generation have done enough. I don't feel people of my generation have done enough. I'm a grumpy middle-aged woman who has not done enough. If I, were, if I were young, I would be quite cross with me. I think young people today um, in, uh, around the world have quite a lot to be cross about, frankly. They didn't warm the planet. They didn't crunch the credit. They didn't start the wars, real and metaphysical, at home and abroad. And yet, they've got to pick up the pieces. And so I don't think that um, I don't think our sons and daughters should be desperately proud of what I've done um, as yet as a human rights campaigner on gender injustice. And I don't think that those that came before me would be that proud either. I don't think the Pankhursts are going. The Chakrabartis have done such a great job. So it's time for me to um, to try a bit. Must try harder. End of term report. Must try harder. Must do better to prioritise gender injustice as a fundamental human rights challenge and violation at home, and further and further away um, as well. I owe it to our sons and daughters, and I owe it to my mother, who I will also pay tribute to. She, um, she died at 69 just a couple of years ago. It's coming up, to, coming up to two years ago on the same morning that Amy Winehouse died. This is significant, by the way. There is a, there is a point in this. You know, this sentence will come to some sort of point, I promise. It will come to an end as well. You'll get your lunch. You'll get your discussion. Um, yeah, it, I, it's poignant for me that my mother was, um, w w died on the, the same day as Amy Winehouse because... She was a woman of her generation, grew up in India, and was deprived the opportunities that she secured for me. The opportunities to fulfill her talents, um, uh, and, and her talents were many, and I'm only realizing to some extent now, with hindsight, what some of those talents were, and how, how Terrible it is, really, that she was that she was blocked by a bullying father and by you know cultural issues and all sorts of things that that that, that meant she didn't have the kind of opportunities that she secured and encouraged for her daughter me, and in particular, she had a beautiful singing voice, and I didn't realise how beautiful this voice was until my father very recently found a found a tape you know an old fashioned. Some of you look too young to even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> cassette tape. There used to be these things, boys and girls, called cassette tapes. <laughs> yes, that's C-A-S-S. -S -S. Oh, it doesn't matter. And, um, and my father found this cassette tape of my mother singing in the kitchen in, into this tape recorder, presumably for herself, not thinking this would ever be found. And, um, and, he, and he, he, played, he played the tape and was obviously quite moved by it you know he's he's well into his 70s now in fact he's going to be he's going to be 80 next year like liberty he's been around he's been around a fair bit he got this he got this this music this this beautiful singing voice put onto a to to a cd and i listened to it with my dear friend barbara hannigan who's a world-class soprano i listened to it in my kitchen just a few nights ago and she said you know your mother could really sing and you know what she could I can say this, it's not about me, it's my, I can't sing, I can't sing, but she did encourage me to take my opportunities with both hands, I was brought up to believe that I could be anything I wanted to be, brain surgeon, prime minister, you know, high court judge, whatever, that's what she did for me, and I'm not sure I've done quite enough yet, perhaps I've got a bit more time. Perhaps I've got a bit more time to honour that legacy and make her proud of me. And that is about prioritising um, 
gender injustice. Women are extraordinary with power and change when they're doing it on someone else's behalf. That's my experience. Look at my dear friend and inspiration, Doreen Lawrence. Tell me who's been a more inspiring political figure in the United Kingdom in recent years. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine as a mother a, a worse, a worse nightmare than the loss of a child. I just can't imagine. You know, I talked about losing my mother. That is, you know, that's not something that I'm comfortable talking about. But imagine losing a child. It's the most unnatural, unspeakable pain. And to be capable of converting that, that terrible, tragic loss into such a powerful campaign for justice, not just for her son, but for other people's sons and daughters, and race equality in our country. What an inspiration. And there are other women like this that, that, that you meet, that I meet in my human rights work at Liberty, who are capable of mustering that passion and that energy when it's on someone else's behalf, behalf. often it's someone close to them. Like a, like a family member. Janice, Janice Sharp and Gary McKinnon. You remember Gary McKinnon, the, um, the, 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 the young man with uh, Asperger's syndrome who was going to be extradited to the US? Because he was supposed to be a great big enemy of the, of, the, of the states because he'd been looking for UFOs on the internet and managed to hack into the Pentagon. Do you remember this story? And the silly people over there, instead of giving him a job in security, they decided to to turn him into a terror suspect. But again, his mother, 10-year campaign to keep her son close to home and not have him off in some American penitentiary. So there, there is this amazing passion and energy and drive and skill. It's just, it just needs to be converted into, um, into mainstream politics, frankly. People need to do as I say and not as I do and actually stand as candidates for office. That's what needs to happen. And the party leaders in all the parties need to be asked, point blank, what are you doing to secure equal representation in which, uh, whichever tier of government and whichever tier of, um, of legislation, what are you doing? Write to them. And let's, and let's get their policies and, their, and their, let's, let's do FOI on these people. Uh, enough talk already. Yes, we want inspiration, and yes, we want role models, and yes, I believe in mentoring, and yes, I believe in all of that stuff, and it all needs to happen because people need the confidence to come forward. Let them come forward, but other people are sometimes going to have to stand aside as well. That's what they're going to do. We're, we're, some men are going to have to stand aside in solidarity with this movement because it's as much for them as it is for the women. It's as much for my son as it is for your daughters. And I'm, impa I'm, in I'm impatient for change. So I have changed my view about affirmative action and, and positive legislative and other practical measures um, to improve representation um, in, in, in seats of power. I think, uh, you know, I, I'm always defending the judiciary and the rule of law, and I will till my last breath, but it is a shocker that there's only one woman in the Supreme Court, and she was the first. Wonderful Baroness Hale of Richmond, but she was the first and she's the only, and that's not good enough. And I, you know, I'm a great fan of the judiciary and I passionately believe in the rule of law, but the legitimacy of the institution needs, um, ne needs a, a better reflection of people's life experience. You can be a man and do justice for a woman, but you know, people looking up at these institutions need to see something that looks a little bit like themselves and not something that looks completely different and alien from them. So I want change in the judiciary, in the boardroom, in the marketplace. I want to see us use the power that we have as consumers, as contractors, as employers, as managers to in our lives. In our, I do this at Liberty. You know, when I came to Liberty, the senior staff and the board were all male, and the worker bees, well, you know. And now it's different. Now it's different, and it, you know, it just kind of happened. What can I tell you? <laughs> it just kind of happened a little bit. It, 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 it happened. It comes to some extent organically, but it also requires. We had a constitutional amendment at Liberty um, for a period for a few years that allowed the co-option of women onto our council. 
It was a constitutional amendment. It was time limited, just for a few years. Women were co-opted, and, and then the amendment ran out, and we never needed it again, because there was a critical mass on that elected structure. And then, and then it happened organically after that. So that's what I think for what it's worth. I told you I wasn't in a position to lecture anybody on this subject. I'm maybe just beginning, you know, this, this, part, of my, uh, this part of my human rights struggle. But I, I do think that you have extraordinary potential here in Wales to, to be an example to me and my colleagues back in Westminster and to women's freedom struggles around the world. What you do here could be a wonderful beacon around the world. And I wish you every solidarity and success. And thank you for listening. Right. Thank you very much indeed. A lot of thought-provoking comments and observations. I can't believe there must be, there can't be loads of questions. So we're going to have a question and answer session. And uh, the microphone will come to you. I would like you to say who you are um, before you ask your question. Um, but please feel free, put your hands up, and we'll try and accommodate as many people as we can. Um, hello there. Um, my name is Dr. Claire Malcolm. I'm here from Cardiff University. I wanted to say, first of all, just thank you. Thank you so much for such an inspiring, moving speech. Um, so, so much that you said that was wonderful. But what struck me, for obvious reasons, is this, this notion of being statistically valuable. Okay? Um, as currently the only uh, female lecturer in the politics department at Cardiff University, and one who is obviously, if you can't see me, mixed race, um, this statistical value issue is a real thing for me, and I've been trying very hard to um, draw attention to it, to mobilize people around it. Um, what strikes me is I would desperately love to work with more women in my department, um, mixed race or otherwise, um, but I also want to see change in the context of my department, the, the, the situation in which these women would be working, so that the increased numbers are then sustainable. And I think that maps onto what's happening with the Welsh Assembly, where we started off with that magical 50% and we've fallen away from that. So I guess the question, this is um, a, a fairly general question, what can we do about changing the context in which women operate to make sure that um, these positive changes are sustainable? Okay, we'll come to the over there next. Do you want to answer that one first? Well, I mean, look, um, uh, we're, we're calling this question and answer, but this is discussion, right? We're all just brainstorming together. We're all just, you know, I don't, know, I don't, I don't have the answers, but I can tell you what, we, what I've tried to do in, in, in my workplace. You know, we, we have to change the, you have to, we, we have to try and remove some of the blockages and they're not just, I mean, and some of them are just overt discrimination, but, but some of it is more indirect and, and more subtle and it's things like flexibility and it's things like, yes, yeah, things like flexibility, it's things like childcare, it's, it's, all the, it's all the obvious things and we need to, and we need to take positive steps um, in, in that regard uh, as well. And you know, it's good for, it'll be good for your male colleagues for there to be more flexibility or more childcare or, um, I mean, the academy is not always as enlightened as one might think. That's my experience of talking to, to, to women academics like you. When one always thinks that academics are all great, pro you know, sandal wearing progressives, but um, it, can be, it can be quite a patriarchal space as well, I think. Um, and I mean, there are obvious things like there should be women on the panel. You know, there should be people of both, ideally, of both genders on on recruitment panels. And there should be well, you will know better than me what the blockages are in 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 your. But I do kind of think that childcare is a massive issue. I do think when it comes to employment, childcare is a massive, massive, massive issue. When I think of how it's been possible for me to do my work, I told you I have one child. You know. Being able to afford um, childcare from the beginning has been, you know, has been crucial, and I don't know how how one copes without that. I have to say. Thank you for that. I mean, short comment for me. I had a man working for me once who took me two years to discover he had a disabled child because he didn't want to admit. Yeah. He saw that as a sign of weakness, you know, which is terrible, terrible, and nobody should have to feel like that. But it happens. The lady at the back wanted us wanted to contribute. Hello, um, Jenny Rathbone, a Labour Assembly member for Cardiff Central. 
Um, you're right to point out that we've gone backwards in the National Assembly. Uh, we started from a very strong base, but we have gone backwards. The Labour group is 50-50, but um, talking to colleagues who were in the previous assemblies, you know, it has made a difference that there has now been a reduction in women. And I think it's up to other parties to adopt the sort of measures that Labour has adopted to have having all women shortlists. Because sadly, when you have open short shortlists of candidates for any level, um, there is a huge uh, disadvantage for women because women and men prefer men. And we can't wait around until the 22nd century to address this difference. And we massively need women to stand in public positions at all levels of government. And that means school governors, mm. local councillors, health boards, you know, the National Assembly. Um, so I hope we can get some action from um, the other parties to ensure that there are better representation from women, as well as in my own party. Um, and um, let's you know, move forward. I think that's so well said, but, but I, I, I also think that, um, that women need to reach out to each other across, across party political divide, uh, divides. I think that's really important. I think that, um, that Labour women like you should be encouraging. I'm sure you would. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you wouldn't, but um, this, is, this is something that so inevitably people who are involved in party politics find, um, find difficult, and I, under, I understand that because you know, they're, they're moved into politics because of their values and their, um, and their party and, and, and so on. But I think you know, sometimes one should even, I, I think I'm getting to a point where I might even consider in a particular context voting for somebody um, because, because they're a woman rather than just because, I mean, you know, within reason, you understand. Um, <laughs> but I think that when I think about our work at Liberty and how we've worked with people across, across party politics, I think that the feminist movement could think sometimes a bit more like that. I know this, uh, this is, this is, this is um, dangerous stuff. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've been in rooms where that kind of idea has been a shock. It's been absolutely shocking that, um, that uh, you know, a Labour woman might make common cause with a Conservative woman or, or whatever it is. But I think um, it, for some things it's worth doing. If you're trying to change cultures and practices and, and make sure that there's, you know, creches and, you know, I, I, I do think that women across party divides ought to sometimes come together and take and take concerted action because the challenge is just so enormous. Um, um, I think it's worth doing that. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. There's a question over here, maybe in the front. Yes, you. Yeah. Well, I'm Shivani Roy from North Wales. So like many people here, I have got a few hats to put on. Today I'm putting on on the uh, head of uh, the founder chair of North Wales Association for Multicultural Integration, or NOAMI. Well, um, they're saying, we all know the saying, behind every successful man, there's a woman. What is your comment on that, please? Behind every successful man, there's a woman. Is that, you know, um, what is my comment on that? It's. Um, I don't have a comment on that. I, I'm, forgive me, but you know, I, I'm just not interested in that anymore. I don't. The question was that you know, there's an old adage about behind every successful man there's a woman or something. You know, I'm. I find that depressing. I, don't, I you know, I, I, it's 2013. I don't want to know who's behind the successful man. I just want. <laughs> You know, I want to. I want to encourage Thank you. successful women. Question at the back next. Then let's lead with a hand up at the back. There we go. Hi, I'm Julie James. I'm the Labour AM for Swansea West. I just wanted to ask you to comment on the changes to the legal aid provisions mm. and the effect you think that that might be having on women and um, uh, the domestic violence issues generally surrounding that. Well. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Legal aid is being decimated. Actually, decimated is too, is too mild a word, because that means one in 10, doesn't it? So let's not use decimated, obliterated. How about that? 
obliterated and it is absolutely disgusting and it's a front it's an affront to the ruler it's not just a this isn't just austerity this isn't just a nip and a tuck or you know this is the obliteration of a, a, a vital public service without which you cannot have the rule of law right if you don't have access to advice and representation you and you don't have access to justice then where is the law what does the law mean it's 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 a dead letter in a sealed book and you have no access to it. And what does that mean in practice? It means abuses of power that will go unchecked. That's what it means. It w it, and it relates to, and it will relate to things like domestic violence and, and issues in the home. And this is, what, what I have to say is, that, and this is not a party political point because the last lot started it with respect to the, you know, to the Labour members who, who've spoken. Um, you know, Mr. Blair started this and it started with dishonouring uh, law in thought and word and deed, and it was the fat cats and the gravy train of legal aid, and everybody thought, oh, well, you know, it's about rich lawyers. This is not about rich lawyers. This is about poor people who are not going to get protected from abuses of power. This is people like Doreen Lawrence or Janice Sharp or, you know, and, and, and of course, because of the way that, um, that power and money is, is um, distributed, it's obviously going to hit women hardest. You know, I am proud to live in a country where if you get run over in the street, you get scraped up off the street, hopefully, and taken off to the emergency room without someone looking for your handbag or your wallet. And I was, all my adult life, proud to live in a country where when you're in court and something serious is potentially going to happen to you, you would have equal access to that court door and an, a fair hearing in front of that judge, you know, regardless of your, your economic means. And that's just, not the, that's just not the case anymore. And it will mean abuses go unchecked. And that can be domestic abuse. That could be, you know, these terrible, you know, marital disputes where children are, you know, being shuffled about. And it's, it's, it's an absolute, and when the state is abusing its power, right? When people are, you know, suffering in custody or, or being neglected and when they're supposed to be looked after by the state, this is an absolute scandal. And, you know, my profession, I, I, I'm, by the way, I'm a recovering lawyer. You see, I do, you see, we do it. We do, this, we do the self-deprecating lawyer jokes and we play into the hands of these wicked politicians who want to say, you know, don't do, doctors don't do that. But, we, but the legal profession has not been a very good advocate in its own cause. And this is not about money for the legal profession. This is about a vital public service. Without, and all public services are vital, don't get me wrong, but I think this one is particularly important because without it, power is abused and it goes unchecked and that's whether it's power in a relationship in a home or whether that's power in the country with a home secretary or a prime minister or whoever behaving badly to vulnerable people that's what's at stake here thank you very much and lindsay winter at the back i think let's have the voice of a uh, voice of a man yes <laughs> Hello, uh, Shami. My name is uh, Lindsay Whittle. Um, uh, but you can tell voice. by my name that I'm entitled to be here, of course, uh, <laughs> because I often get referred to as Miss, Mrs. or Ms. <laughs> but I am definitely a, a Welsh rugby a union loving man. Um, but, uh, can but, you but sing as well? You sound like you I can. I can sing indeed if you want, but I, I won't okay. sing today. Uh, you'll be delighted to learn. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, to answer Jenny Rathbone's point, um, it, it's important that you know uh, that many political parties in Wales are doing their best uh, to, to promote uh, women uh, to public office. Our top five posts, uh, 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 our leader, our deputy leader, our chief executive, our chair, um, uh, I can't remember more, but they're all women, so that's a good start. But I wanted to ask you about the media. You say the media described you as the most dangerous woman in Britain. I can't uh, understand how drunk that editor was, but um, I, I would say we would certainly need uh, dangerous women like you here in Wales, and you'd be very welcome to come and live and, and campaign in Wales. You're a bit of a um, silver-tongued politician. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Um, I'm saying all the right things, I hope. But uh, it, it's when the media start talking 
uh, about nonsense like blares, babes, um, you know, yeah. that, that really sticks in my throat. I also describe myself as a feminist, uh, and mm. I think that's important. The you die hard. Uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> as a Welshman, oh yeah. I could be die hard, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yes, I, I am a feminist, uh, and I'm delighted to tell you that we have a debate next week sponsored by uh, my good friend in front of me, uh, Rebecca uh, from uh, Swansea, um, who will be discussing, in fact, um, the, uh, the use of page three and, and the Sun, that terrible newspaper, which I hope no <laughs> one here buys. Um, for shame on you if you do. But uh, I mean, <laughs> what can you do about the media? And is there anything, please, you can do at, uh, when you're next appearing on Question Time about David Dimbleby, please? <laughs> I'm killing thee. <laughs> what do I say? What do you do? I don't need to say anything. Well, I yeah. think you're welcome to comment on after, so yeah. Well, I, I, I um, you know, I, what can I do about the media? Goodness me can I do about the media? I think that um, I think that women are underrepresented in the media and I think we need to use our we need to use our our pester power as men and women to get the to get the media that we that we want and uh, and we we deserve um, and I mean it's just you know it's the classic stuff isn't it you know you have the new the, the news readers and you have the old you have the old geezer and the beautiful when you know, you've got the age stuff, you've got the general representation stuff. You, um, it, 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 it goes on and on. But, 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 let's not, let me not just grumble. Let me try and, let me try and be positive. Somebody once said to me after I'd given a very grim speech about the war on terror and all these terrible human rights abuses, wonderful woman, scientist, came up to me and said, that was very interesting, Shami. I understand that the world is going to hell in a handcart, but do remember, please, that Martin Luther King never said, I have a nightmare. <laughs> so this was such good advice from this from this woman scientist. I think it was in Bristol that I that I do try to, to to be positive. I do think that with new media and social media, we have an enormous opportunity. We really, really do. We really, really do compared to uh, the campaigning opportunities of previous of previous generations. And we need to the newspapers. Yeah, have a debate about wicked newspapers and so on. Their circulations all declining even the even even the one that you um that you mentioned um and um so they've they've got their own issues um going on but we uh, but, but social media is really quite potent and it's a great it's a, it's a great way to connect people up all over the world and it's a great way to mobilize people for a popular campaign, including you know, consumer campaigns. And um, we just got to use our power to get the, po the politics we, we want and deserve, the media we want and deserve. Let's, let's, let's do it. I, 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 think, I think we can, enormous, enormous potential there. Good, I think everybody should tweet that immediately. <laughs> Gentlemen in the center here, please. My name is Max. I've got four daughters and one son. And like the gentleman behind me, I am very grateful that you have embraced us in this meeting. The gentleman has asked you a question about the media. I want to ask you a question about education. Right. Uh, which follows on from your uh, the former meeting we had with Susan Greenfield, in which we agreed greatly that it is critical that attitudes are changed as early as possible mm. in children's lives. It's also very kind of you to talk about us living dangerously, bless you, and also to say it's not just a question and answer business, it's a forum. May I congratulate you on that as well, which shows you're willing to live dangerously. <laughs> I'll just give you a little bit of danger now to set you going. We've had a polemic from the Labour Party about how important it is to have shortlists. Well, there's a shortlist going on at the moment in Anglesey, but I don't see any women on it. Are there worth, no women worth, on it? Worth thinking mm. about. No. Are there That's no women for the, this is the by-election? Yes. What, there's yeah. no women? Surely not. Uh, well, we won't, that's dangerous. Don't go there. <laughs> it, that's just that the counterbalance. That can't be right, can it? That's the counterbalance, the polemic. It's not here for a polemic. Anyway, look. Now, anyway, let's go yeah. on about the education. Okay. Now, um, here's something that will keep you thinking. I've got, in one of my daughter's families, three boys and one girl. The boy is seeking to go to medical college. So my little 
the daughter was, granddaughter was younger, caused me to sit down. She took my breath away. I said, what do you think you'll be doing? She said, oh, well, well, well Grampy, I, I, I won't be going to medical school because doctors are boys and nurses are women. That is the educational problem that we're fighting. And my daughter is, is a feminist, I wouldn't say she's die hard, but those children have been brought up in an environment where the education system, as we knew about science, is exactly the same, is failing dramatically. That's where I'm gonna ask you about the education. One other thing, when you spoke about emotion, I think it was a great compliment to you. Emotional intelligence, I know it was meant in a pejorative way, but I think you are an emotional person. I think you touched hearts today. It is a great credit to be an emotional person. But can I ask you, in the educational arena, yeah. do you think that it is terribly difficult to educate the emotions of boys and men so that they act properly towards women in their homes and in everything else in life so that women can achieve their potential? Right, you've, lift, you've given me a lot to think about there, sir. So yes. let me just try and do some kind of... No, 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 abs no absolutely it's a forum. I mean, let's be... Uh, you know, I always say to people... Um, I mean, by the way, doing this is one of the, the, the greatest privileges of my work. I love being able to speak to people for real, OK? I don't like lecturing people. I am not a, one of these great sort of demagogues, you know, I, you know, these kind of... I'm not going to name them, but you know some of the blokes I'm talking about with the, you know, the great rhetorical flourish and let's go and bomb this country and that kind of, that's, that's, that's not my deal, right? So I actually... One of the greatest joys of my working life is to be able to actually look people in the eye and, and talk to them with them rather than hopefully, hopefully at them. Um, and I think that we... as to, to be a human rights campaigner, surely is to treasure human beings for what they are and to actually think that we as creatures are slightly better than not. You know, there is an optimism in, in this belief system. You know, I don't think we're all wicked and needing to be controlled the whole time and crushed and whatever. I think that when we're empowered, we do, we do, we do good things. Now, I think that human beings are... You talked about emotion, so I think that human beings are creatures of emotion and reason, faith and logic. You know, we're... These things are all interconnected. When you think about some of the very, very important decisions that we make in life without a calculation, you know, who we like, who we love, who we don't, you know, a lot of times it's an instinct, it's an emotion, and then there's a kind of rational, and then clever people are the ones with the great um, ex post facto rationalization for why they did or didn't do this. That's, that to me is kind of part of, I'm just being honest, I think that's part of my experience, and maybe it's part of other people's human um, experience too. And uh, I mean, why I picked that, that story about Mr. Hoon on Question Time was it was definitely, you, know, you watch it, you just, maybe I'm being paranoid, but you have a look at it on just Chakrabarti Hoon, Question Time, emotional about torture. And, you know, and, and I think we know what he was saying. He was asking me what, what week it was, wasn't he? Yeah? Wasn't he? Have you che checked your calendar, madam? Mm -hmm. You know, come on. We know what, it's a classic, it's a classic um, put down. But more seriously, I do agree with you that um, it would be good for men um, and boys to, the other side of the coin is that it ought to be okay for men and boys to express yeah. their emotions. That's the thing, we, we're all in prison. <laughs> You know, if, if some of us are in prison, we're all in prison in, in, in this. If, if, if women are uh, forced to um, be a certain way, that means men are being forced to be a certain way too. That's why I say this is as much for, um, for my son and your son as it is for your daughters. We're all in this together. Now, that does mean a negotiation at times. And it does, I was once, here's another anecdote. This is all anecdotes from me, isn't it? Um, but I think it's important. I was once speaking to a group of, um, of, of lawyers about a, a consultation that the last government did about, about the judiciary, about reforming the judiciary and getting more diversity in the, in the judiciary. And one gentleman who shall remain nameless, um, who was, a, was is, you know, um, a, a very leading barrister back in London, and I considered him a friend, said, well, you know, if we have to have diversity in the judiciary, we'll have to have people with mental health problems, won't we? <laughs> if we have to have, you know, perfect diversity and representation in the judiciary, 
you have to have, you know. I'm thinking, oh, right. That's your response to the idea that there aren't enough women mm. on the bench. And of course, where that was coming from was, was fear. This was somebody who perhaps felt that he hadn't been promoted or what, you know, I understand. I understand that nobody wants to, you know, sometimes people, the idea of standing aside or, or not even standing aside, just standing in line or standing in front of a level, you know, a, a, a level, standing on a level playing field is uncomfortable. If you've had, if you've had a certain type of privilege, it's not nice to feel that you're not going to have it anymore. But it's, it's in everybody's interests in the end. As for your granddaughter, is your granddaughter with the I have to be a nurse and the boys? There are, you know, there are, there are books. There are great story books that now the, these days compared to when I was a girl, you know. Very inspirational characters. I think we need to sort out her reading. Yeah, I, I think we want some great, some great princess smarty pants and all of these wonderful children's books that are out there now, you know, and even Hermione Granger and Harry Potter, I mean, extraordinary. So I think we're going to, I think it's the, I think it's the, the children's literature for your granddaughter that's going to, um, that's going to help. And, um, and, and also some amazing role models. Introduce her to, you know, some young girl who's a medical student or who's just a few years older than her and doing, doing her, I was going to show my age and say O levels. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't been called O levels for about 150 years. Anyway, I shall shut up. I'm rambling now. And just to say, you no, know, obviously your grandchildren have got a role model in their grandfather. Yeah. I think that's, they're very lucky. No. Sorry, we we we, we, no, so we mustn't we, we, we mustn't stop. You and I mustn't stop. We'll no. you know. Sorry about that, but there is a question at the front here that I promised. Uh, we can do next then. So let's have two questions one after another so we can maybe answer both at the same time. Here, put your hand up, Vivian. And then next over there, please. Hi, uh, Rebecca Rumble, uh, Dr. Rebecca Rumble from uh, Cardiff University. So, did you say doctor? The doctors are getting younger. I feel, you know, they they say that you're getting old. You, you, they say that you're getting old when the policemen and the school teachers um, look. Uh, forgive me. Uh, um, the doctors too. The doctors too. Sorry. Do go ahead. Um, it links in with with what Max said and what what you've been talking about. Um, women, girls, performing better in school, performing better in universities, and then that's not coming through. Mm once women enter the workplace. Now, I don't know if it's something that we're doing wrong in the universities. <laughs> Maybe it's because there aren't enough female professors. Um, but I also kind of think it's part of that kind of emotional thing that um, we're not naturally aggressive. Most women don't go into meetings thinking, I really want to have a fight in here. You know, we want to go in and find solutions and be inclusive. And I often feel that a lot of the women that, that do succeed are having to actually change and emulate more masculine qualities to be heard. So I suppose my question is, you know, how, how much do you think we should compromise in trying to, to get to that point? Do you have a question from you at the same time as I can yeah. get two together? These are all massive questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm Jasmine Chowdhury, I'm one of the shortlisted candidate for Cardiff Central, all women shortlisted. Congratulations. So thank you. <laughs> I'm not, I don't care which party, by the way. I just think, you know, we should give the woman candidate a, ra a round of applause. Do, do, do you take my point? Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Thank you so much for a very inspiring talk. So two weeks from Hastings' speech, I'm, I'm, I've recorded your talk, and I'm going to use a lot of that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, having, having worked in the public sector for a long time, um, we've already seen some strong evidence coming through about the impacts of the austerity measures and the disproportionately hit on, you know, women will be bearing the brunt of that for decades to come, I think. So how, how do we keep raising the aspiration? How do we encourage more women to uh, not to lose hope, come forward and carry on um, when, you know, we, we know they're losing their jobs, they're being made redundant, um, and the policies seem to be all against, against all our well, aspiration? Well. Firstly, you're doing it right now, right? You don't need me to tell you because you're doing it. And I'm, you know, credit to you. And um, I'm not a candidate for political office. You are. So you are doing it. You are making it happen. You are the example. You are the inspiration. And you will be knocking on doors. As I said, I'm not even interested in this context, which party you're, you're representing. Um, you're organizing. You know, this is democracy. This is what it's, this is, 
this is what it's all about. You will be knocking on those doors. You will be asking people to vote for you. You will be asking people to sign this and tweet that. And you're making it happen. And you don't... What well, you've got... How dare I give you an answer to that question? You are the answer. Um, what was the other bit? What was the other thing the you were saying? Oh, the, the other point was the university point as well about there being lots of women doing very well in school yeah. and university, and then they okay. seem to not come through. This is the million dollar. This is the million dollar um, question. It's obviously complex, isn't it? So sometimes there is an element of just. In let's be honest, there is always an element with with selection and promotion in the workplace. Um, that is dis that is discrimination. That is just point blank overt discrimination. Well, we've you know I've told some of my war stories and other people have right. So some of it is just overt discrimination. Some of it legally we would call indirect discrimination. Some of it is just is just subtle. You know when women are described as um, lacking impact. You know when when people are sitting around discussing promotions and they're saying well so and so lacks impact. You know. Or lacks confidence. Or, well, what are you doing to 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 encourage it? And you made this very um, subtle point about masculine and feminine qualities. I'm never sure about that because everybody's different, aren't they? I mean, it, I mean, that's yeah. Everybody's different. I'm capable of a bit of aggression occasionally. <laughs> Maybe you are too. You know, let's not assume that it's all completely. You know, it's completely um, cut and dried. I think we. You know, we. You know, we have different qualities within us, and we we try and use them, and they can be. You know, they can come to the. Uh, do you want Chakrabarti on identity? Right, Chakrabarti on identity. There's two. Ki there's. Um, this is my sort of tin pot wisdom. You know, there's too many sound bites. As a campaigner, I've done so many sound bites over the years that I think I can only think in these in these small chunks. I think that um, there's two ways of looking at identity. In the, only two ways because that's how libertarian I'm being right now, okay? Not three ways, not 14 ways, two ways of looking at identity, says Chakrabarti in Cardiff, right? <laughs> See how this goes down. Um, one way of looking at identity is like a military uh, checkpoint, where you go to the checkpoint and you're trying to, get, you're trying to cross a border and um, somebody asks you for your identity card or your papers or whatever and gives you a hard stare and, you know, normally there's a weapon in the background. It's all very menacing. And someone decides for you wh what your identity is, what your label is, and whether you pass or whether you don't pass. Okay? And then the alternative... And I'm really laying myself open to ridicule with this, but that's, I'm just putting myself out there today, aren't I? I'm just, you know, my, my lily-livered bleeding heart is, liberal heart is every... So the alternative is the supermarket checkout for, th for these purposes. Work with me, okay? And it's, um, imagine one of those little, those little um, convenience stores and um, you've got your basket on a Friday night, yeah, those kind of inner city, shishi convenience stores, you know, you've got your little basket on a Friday night, you're just popping out to get whatever. And you, p you decide, no, obviously you need to have some cash, so just forget that for a moment. But if you've got a little bit of cash, you get to choose what goes in your basket. Now, someone's standing behind you in the queue having a nose, right? Of course they are, and they're going, oh, look, she's got a nice bottle of wine in her basket, but actually it was her birthday. She doesn't, normally she has a pint of beer in there, but, to, you know, she was splashing out. Maybe it's fizzy, right? Um, and someone's having a good old nose and deciding things about you. Maybe there's a, there's a chicken tikka masala in there. Maybe it'll be Welsh cakes the next week, but the point is, and of course I'm laying myself open to ridicule with this slightly bourgeois notion of, but the, the point is, you choose. And a different thing might be on the top of your basket or in your basket at a different moment in your life. You know, maybe at some moments it's, it, you know, the, it's the, the woman part that is a really important part of your identity. Another time, I'm an academic, and when you're with your academic mates, slagging off lawyers, I know. <laughs> no, the point is there are different ties that bind us together, different and therefore different ways to be solid with each other. Um, for me, though, at this moment, the, you know, the, the feminist one is really important. I think it's the key to all sorts of things in, in the world, I, I, I have to say. But I wouldn't assume that it's, you know, aggression is just a male thing and submission is just a... Uh, I, think, I think we're potentially more complicated than that, and I think, therefore, that the blockages and the bars are, are, are more complex, too. And we, we just need to work... And we need to work with men, too, by the way, I think. That's my view. 
um, because uh, it'll be a nicer working environment for everybody when it's a, when it's a bit more natural, I think. Thank you. We've got one question. Can you I will stop rambling, yes. Well, I last, know, this Anne, is the last sorry. question, I'm afraid. And just then banging if on we can have and it. on. That bloody woman from Liberty just yeah. never stops. Short Thank question, you. if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Joy Kent, um, Chief Exec of Quarry and we're a Wales-wide charity um, that's about the economic development of women. So a lot of the things that have been spoken about today about flexibility in the workplace, about childcare, all those kind of issues, this is the kind of stuff that we work on. I just wanted to say to everybody in the audience, if there's if any of these issues, you know, we're here to help you and help in the workplace. So please come and, and talk to me afterwards about um, anything that we can do to support women to be more visible and more economically independent. But what I wanted to sort of... Um, to, to ask you about really was we recently held um, uh, a conference around um, the austerity measures and the impact on women because I think it's something I haven't been uh, with Corotev for very long um, and I think it's um, really been invisible the impact that the disproportionate impact the, the austerity measures and the benefit cuts as part of that are going to have on women and of course Fawcett Society has calculated that three quarters of the proposed savings through benefit changes alone um, will come from women's pockets. And obviously there's also the point about universal credit going to the one person in the household. So for the first time since the late 1800s, a group of women in our society will have no financial independence of their own, no money of their own in those households. And yet this hasn't really, um, I don't think it, this is in the public domain particularly. Um, we're really keen to get it out there in the public domain and I totally agree with you about the social media side of things. But what are your thoughts on that and um, any tips from your campaigning experience about how we do that? Okay. Uh, we need to get you away in about okay. five minutes, Shani. So, okay. just so I think we've got, to, so let's mobilise and let, you know, let, uh, and I'm, I'm really getting, I'm, I'm really getting into this whole idea about the social media because my young, my young <laughs> colleagues, many of them brilliant young women actually, I tell you, it's a question about role models, I consider them to be my role models now. You know, they teach me how to use my iPod and stuff like that. You know, it's, um, but they are getting really into the, p the potential for using new media and social media to, to launch popular campaigns, which of course sit very well with putting pressure on politicians. They get very spooked when there's suddenly X thousand people in a camp, they really do get spooked. I mean, they, as they should, that's democracy, right? That's democracy. So um, I think there's, and, and if, if you feel that conventional media is ignoring something, this is a great, you know, but also you can put pressure on, um, on conventional media to um, using these mechanisms too. You know, the, the line between old media and, and new uh, uh, media is blurred. And in terms of, and then there's so much fun you can have with campaigning. There's stunts and petitions and test case litigation and all, all sorts of fun things um, to be had to, to but, uh, but also I think maybe putting pressure on, frankly, some women who are in the parties that you think are doing whatever the wickedness is. They need to, because they, you know, need to, need to address that in their own um, identity, political and personal identity. There's so much fun you can have with this and, and, and all to the good, and, and good luck to you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Diachan Valian, last question, I'm afraid. Thank you all for coming. Thank you particularly to our guest, um, it, what's the word? Not, not lecturer, no, 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 no. interlocutor, possibly is the Just word. a guest. Yes, yes. Thank I'll you for having well, me, as my mother taught me to say, and I sometimes mean. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I think we all say as our friend. So thank you for becoming our friend, thank a you. friend of Wales today, and of Welsh women and men. Thank you very much. And we will have a lot to think about after today, but can we all just thank Shami once again? Oh, thank you. Thank you.